Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, coming to you as usual from San Diego. And today I am joined by Alison Shapira, who is actually joining us from Florida today. How are you doing, Alison? Hi, John. I'm great. How are you? Good, good. And Alison's one of the world's foremost experts on public speaking and presentation skills. You migrated from being an opera singer to an entrepreneur, um, and you um, you now you wrote the book "Speak with Impact: How to Command the Room and Influence Others." And what we wanted, yes, the book behind you right there. And what we wanted to talk about today was, well, you obviously teach public speaking and all of that, and the pandemic, uh, the speaking bit still there, but the public bit not so much, right? So you had to. Uh, you had to pivot your business. And I guess the first thing I think will be really interesting to our, our listeners and viewers is how did you go about pivoting your business? Because your business is so in person and people focused and all of that kind of stuff. How did you pivot that to a virtual environment? We did it very quickly and very decisively because more than 90% of our business had been in-person training or coaching in public speaking and presentation skills. So March, April of last year, everything disappeared, all of our revenue, because everyone was putting mm -hmm. training and coaching on hold. No one was traveling. So we checked in with our clients. What do you need? How are you doing? And realized what everyone needed was help making that shift from in-person to virtual. And all of us on our team were very comfortable on camera being warm and authentic. And we realized a lot of our clients, especially those who had made a living in sales, calling on clients in person, had 20 years, 30 years of confidence pitching in person, taking clients to lunch, but then now ask them to use WebEx or Zoom with a client and all of that confidence fell apart. So we very quickly realized that our skills and capabilities were, were critically and immediately needed by our clients. So we made that pivot to virtual and have been doing full-time virtual training and coaching ever since. Yeah, that, that's, that's a great story. Um, I just wanted to focus in for a moment because this is a fascinating phenomena of where you get people who are very comfortable working a room going in presenting to it could be 10 20 500 doesn't matter very confident but you you say switch on your webcam and do this virtually and they freeze and it's i think it's something that a lot of people don't really understand what's going on how and especially the people themselves how, how have i gone from being this really confident in-person person to this really lacking confident virtual person that's right. That that transition is is challenging because essentially what people have done is spent 20 years building one particular skill set and virtual communication is a completely different skill set. If you think about it as simply as what lighting do I need to control? What's the best camera to use? Some people are using a, a company issued laptop that they've had for 10 years and that webcam, they haven't even learned to clean the webcam. So small skills like that, as simple as where do I put my notes? I used mm. to have bullet points here. Maybe now I'm using two screens. So my notes are here, but my camera is here, but I'm looking at the notes and all of those elements, we have to learn all at once and that's incredibly distracting and that's why our confidence has been so affected because we're trying to learn and implement everything and by the way we're now having twice as many meetings as we used to so now we're doing it again and again and we're exhausted at the same time so that's why i've seen it be so complicated to learn but the good news is once we learn those skills then we can immediately start to see the impact and we're building on that because we can use it every day. Mm -hmm. I guess the other thing that's probably uh, different for people is that for the first time they can see themselves <laughs> and hear yes. themselves. And that, and it's funny how people are like, well, that's not how I look and that's not how I sound. And you go, well, it is, uh, you just haven't noticed it before, but that can be a real shock to people too. When they suddenly realize I'm having a meeting, a conversation with somebody, but boy, I can actually see and hear myself too. That's a scary. That right. We're not, we're not ready or we're not used to that level of constant ongoing self-awareness. And mm -hmm. I've heard a lot of people talk about how helpful it's been for them to turn off self-view on Zoom or WebEx. 
I never did that because I'm usually the one presenting. And for me, mm-hmm. I like to use my hands. I always want to check, right. Can are my hands in the frame? Right. So I like to check in with that visual. But this week, I actually tried turning off self-view in meetings. And it was, it was amazing. The moment I turned off the camera self-view, I immediately felt lighter mm. and more relaxed because I didn't realize how an automatically my camera, my eye defaults to my image. And once I turned that off, I could relax. I could focus on my audience or are the, the people who were speaking. So it, it is a huge emotional and, and intellectual tax. Yeah, yeah, no, and it, it is fascinating. It's fascinating to see how, how people have reacted and who has been able to adapt quickly and who has struggled a little bit. So what are some of the things that people need to consider when speaking virtually? What, what are some of the, let's start with some of the differences between doing something virtually and doing something in person. The biggest difference and the biggest challenge that I find people face is figuring out where to look. In person, mm-hmm. we know where to look. We, we yeah. look at the person who's speaking or we look at the person we're speaking to. We can, we can look around the room. That's natural, or at least it's something that's easier to learn. Mm-hmm. Virtually, we have to look into the camera lens and we have to do it for most of the conversation. We can glance down at people's videos to read their expressions, but then we come back to speak. And that is fundamentally unnatural to speak into a camera lens as opposed to speak into a set of eyes. So that's the first and and most immediate difference that we have to learn in order to connect. And the the funny thing is, the more we look into the camera lens, the it, it feels inauthentic to us, but the more authentic and credible and trustworthy we look to our audience. Isn't it funny? It seems like it'd be just the opposite because of how awkward it feels. But we have to remain audience focused. What do I need to do that has an impact on them? So that's one of the biggest challenges. A second challenge is our ability to read the room. So I know in person, I can see whether someone's checking their phone or not. I can feel their energy if it's high Mm -hmm. or low. I can see if they're learning in, leaning in. Virtually, I have to pause, look down, and you may or may not be multitasking and your expression may or may not be a factor of what I'm saying versus yeah. some somebody who's pinging you on, on instant messenger. So it's harder to read the room. Yeah, no, and I think that's an incredibly important point. And I think that's the one that really throws a, a lot of people because, uh, it's like, as you said, I mean, if you're if you're if you're speaking and you're seeing people on video and they're doing they're doing things that look like they're anything but listening to you, it's very easy to get thrown by that and start to focus over here going, why, why isn't that, what's up with that person? Um, it's very easy to get thrown. And I think that's where you have to really have confidence to take control of the environment right and also to push aside say okay if that person is looking like they're doing something else well so be it there's other people on the call i'm not going to let this distract me that's right and and i would say the same thing in person there could be someone in an in-person meeting who's on their phone or frowning Mm -hmm. maybe frowning is simply how they absorb information Mm -hmm. maybe all of a sudden they're trying to remember if they locked the front door when they left the house i mean we really we don't know when I'm either virtual or in person, I want to put in more intentional moments of interaction where I will stop and ask an open-ended question, not just, does anyone have any questions? I will say, John, let me, let me pause here. John, I know you've dealt with this. What's on your mind? Or, right. or Stacy, how have you dealt with this before? Or what are the implications for your organization? And once I do that, then I force them to respond. And in fact, a program that I did a few weeks ago, the best compliment I received was that I was too engaged to multitask. Ah, very good. So that demonstrates to me that I'm giving people a reason to listen to me. In a, in a closed room, people couldn't escape. They had to stay with us. But in a virtual setting, we have to give them a reason to keep listening to us. Yeah, no, I, ab- absolutely, absolutely. I think the other part is that sometimes what's a little bit weird for, for people who are new to doing things virtually is moments of silence, right? What you just said there, right, is you ask an interesting open-ended question, 
you need to give people sometimes a few moments to actually think about the answer. But but when we're in a virtual environment, we get so scared of silence. Ooh, silence. And then we jump in and we fill the silence and then we interrupt the train of thought of the person we just asked the question to. That's right. And and this is what I used to teach when I would tell people how to have productive conference calls. I would tell them to, to create boundaries around the silence. So I'll say, let me stop for a minute here and see what questions do you have? And I'll give you about 30 seconds to think of a response because I know it may take you some time and I'll pause and then I'll say, let me give you 10 more seconds. And by the way, if you want to speak up, use the raise hand feature, put your comment in the chat. So I'll both speak through the silences and I'll specifically direct them how to respond. Because if I say, who wants to speak up, then there's that awkward moment where one person speaks up and then interrupts another person and you go first. No, you go first. So I have to act as the facilitator yeah. and the facilitator in a virtual setting is much more important than the facilitator in, a, in an in-person setting. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's where you have to have the confidence and, and the control. And you have to do your your homework. And I think that's the other part is it's like any other skill, right, Alison? I mean, practice makes perfect and you should be practicing it. And particularly if your job depends on it, if you're selling virtually today and you weren't before, you probably should spend a little bit of time practicing, figuring out how you operate, recording your sessions maybe, and then looking back and saying, how can I make them even more effective? That's exactly it. An athlete, even the most high performing athletes will take video or watch video of their performance. They'll watch it with their coach and they'll debrief it. What worked? What didn't? What kind of practice do I need to do to get back out on the court or onto the field next time? And we as top performers need to do the exact same thing. And it's even easier in a virtual setting because we know it's either going to be recorded or we yeah. can set up our camera and put it in selfie mode and videotape it ourselves. So it's never been easier to track and, and improve our performance in a practice phase. Yeah, absolutely. And it's amazing the things that you see and come across. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I, I do that quite a lot watching my own. I just, my wife just tells me I'm being narcissistic all the time, but really I am trying to figure out how to improve. <laughs> um, so what, moving on though, what are some of the, the, what are some of the common skills that are needed regardless of whether it's virtual or in, in person, what are some of the fundamentals that maybe sometimes people have forgotten or overlooked? Because I'm a big believer in the better we get at things, sometimes we fall into that trap of ignoring the fundamentals and we start to take shortcuts and things like that because we think we're, well, we don't need to prepare anymore because we're so good at these things that we forget some of the fundamentals. So what are some of the fundamentals? One of the biggest fundamental components of speaking, whether it's in a sales context or any other context, is to remind yourself why you care about what you do, why you care about what you're speaking about or what you're selling. To your point, when we go on automatic, that's when we start to lose our authenticity. That's where we start to sound overly confident or, or overly prepared in a way that doesn't connect with people. How do you do the same pitch a hundred times and make it sound just as persuasive and just as conversational as it was before. There's a question that I ask people before they prepare a pitch or even before they log in for a, a new call. And the question is why you, which means why do you care about your topic, about your audience, about the organization that you represent, because when you acknowledge that, that sense of purpose, then it fuels your language, makes it more authentic. It fuels your energy, makes it more confident. And that's what has a positive impact on your audience. So going back to your sense of purpose is an enormously powerful fundamental in public speaking or presentation skills, whether in person or virtual. Another component that I would recommend is to always take time to pause and breathe before you log in for a call, before you enter a room for a meeting. Five minutes of breathing and centering yourself helps you focus so that you're bringing your best self to that interaction instead of going on automatic. Yeah, no, those are great. Those are great points. Uh, I love the first one. Let's just go back to it for a moment. The why. I think this is incredibly important that people do it anyway, 
um, regardless of whether it's for virtual or, or in person. Um, but, but knowing the why, and, and uh, as you said, because you can come across as inauthentic if you're if it's just become rote for you if this is something like you do all the time and and it's really obvious i mean you, you get calls i get calls whatever it's really obvious when somebody's going through the motions and to your point then i think that idea of giving yourself a few moments beforehand like getting yourself in the right frame of mind breathing and then the why i think the why is is so important and what difference have you seen have you seen that make when people like really focus on their why before they deliver any kind of uh, interaction? There are a few differences that I see. The first difference is they enjoy what they're saying more. So their language becomes more authentic. And because they're enjoying it more, they're more confident. So their audience sees them come across with more energy. Their eyes light up. Their body language is more animated. And as a result, their audience is more willing to receive their message, more willing to listen and think differently or act differently as a result of that message. And I will say, whenever we talk to people who've gone through our training and we say, what was the most impactful or what are you going to use most frequently? The why you, that question mm -hmm. is what they keep coming back to again and again. And it's what they point to years later. Yeah, and, and, I, and I couldn't, I, I really encourage people to really take that piece of advice on board. I think you've probably, right now is the best chance you're ever going to have to establish the why, because we've all been forced into a period of, of self-reflection, whether we wanted it or not. Uh, but I think it's, you, you should take the time now, because I think it will make a, such a huge difference. And as you said, once you work through that, then it, it, it comes out of you in, in your body language and your facial expressions and your energy and all of that stuff. But it's so incredibly, uh, incredibly important. When you work with people, are they, are they surprised themselves the difference between what they deliver after they figure out why they're delivering it as opposed to when they were delivering it because they were, that was what they did? Yes, they're surprised. And they're also surprised at how quickly they can make that transition. I mean, I, I, it's not just a training in which I talk about it. It's a component of my keynotes. So at the end of a 45 minute keynote, they already feel more confident because they've had a chance to think about it and, and share it with the person next to them. So what I love about this training is that there's so much that we can learn immediately. It's not that it takes years or, or weeks of training. This is a quick transition that we can make, which is great because we have so much to learn quickly. It's great to know that we can make that quick change. Yeah. And I think uh, just to finish, I think the other part here is that I think this was starting before the pandemic. I think people were starting to crave a little bit more interaction and, and you know, real human to human interaction. And I think the pandemic has has uh, increased that kind of exponentially. So I think it's more important than ever that we are able to communicate across multiple different platforms and environments in that authentic fashion, because I think that's what people are really, really craving. I agree with you. I, I believe it was a trend at least 10 years of in the making mm -hmm. that has since been expedited because we're all in this virtual environment craving human connection, craving interaction. And what we're seeing is you can create that authentic connection in a virtual setting. You simply have to be intentional about how you prepare for it and how you deliver it. Yeah, and, and I think that's a great point to finish on. I think that word intentional, I think that's so important is to go into things, you know, intentionally having thought them through as opposed to just wing it. Uh, well, listen, Alison, this has been fantastic. All of Alison's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. I would love to, John. I'm a former opera singer who teaches public speaking and presentation skills, both one-on-one -on -one and to groups all around the world. So we love helping people build their confidence, build their skills, and in doing so, build their courage to speak up on behalf of themselves, their organizations, or the communities that they represent. Yes, yeah, so I would really encourage you to check out 
Alison's work, as I said, all the links will be below in her book. I think regardless of what position you're in, you're probably going to be doing a lot more communicating, whether virtually or when we get back to in person, because that's what people are craving. So regardless of what role you're in, I would really encourage you to check it out and do yourself a favor of developing the skills that are really going to make a difference for you. And certainly speaking is and communicating is one of them. Well, listen, thanks very much, Alison. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeline or CRM. I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Thanks, John.